I passed the roll sheet, right? I started in the back, is that correct? Yes. So we need to talk about consumer behavior today. And consumer behavior is one of the major fields and subfields of marketing. There are two contributing disciplines uh, that form the foundation of marketing, and those are economics and psychology. And so a lot of what we're talking about in terms of consumer behavior is psychology. And I make merciless fun of both of those disciplines in, uh, in, in, my, in my presentation because I think there are problems with both of them in terms of what we are able to uh, determine from uh, their insights into human behavior and human activities. But needless to say, they are, they are the foundational disciplines, and so we'll talk about that. Classical consumer behavior models are predicated on an economic theory largely called rational actor theory. And so what we'll do today, your critical blood, the critical thinking challenge, and I'll give you time uh, today to, to answer that, and then on Tuesday we'll come back and we'll talk about your answers to that, and then move into organizational purchasing behavior and see if there's a difference there. But the classical model is what we might call the rational actor model. And we might view this as the thesis in terms of consumer behavior. And this is what is largely detailed in your textbook. So it's this five steps, right? So what happens when consumers decide that they need or want something? What is it that you need or want? This morning, did you get up? and needed what? Food. Food, right? How did you know you needed that? You what? You're hungry. You felt it. It's a physiological need. So what did you do? You went downstairs, if you have an upstairs, or uh, out of your bedroom to the kitchen, and what'd you eat? How many of you eat breakfast? Oh, quite a few of you. How many of you don't eat breakfast? Why don't you eat breakfast? You wake up too late. You'd rather sleep than eat. What would you say? Too much time and effort? Okay. You know, it's not that hard anymore with breakfast bars, carnation instant breakfast, instant cereal. You can't afford it. You're a poor student. So, okay. Well, you know, I say, can't solve all problems. So you have this recognition, and you do this information search, right? Since it's something that you're used to doing every day, what kind of information search are you going to do? An internal or an external? An internal search. You pretty much know what kinds of foods you like for breakfast. How many of you have the same thing over and over again? Because it's easy. What do you have for breakfast? It's the same thing. You have a granola bar. Because it's quick, it's fast, you've got to get to class. You don't have to think about it very hard. How many of you have something other than that that you have to think about? What do you do for breakfast? You like oatmeal? So there's lots of different types of oatmeal. There's cinnamon raisin, right? What else do they have? Instant oats. I like the You like the old fashioned Quaker oats? That's not even so simple anymore. There are all kinds of different kinds of oats. So there's steel cut oats. How many of you have tried steel cut oats? They're a little bit better, I think. A little bit, got a little more texture to them than the classic oatmeal. So you do this internal information search. If it's something that you're not familiar with, what are you going to do? Look it up on the internet. You start with an external information search. Uh, look up the facts. So this is what I do. When I start to buy things, I recognize that I've got a problem. For example, several years ago, when I was still uh, married, we uh, needed a new microwave. So the microwave went out. I start compiling a book. I go to external sources. There are all kinds of features. Start compiling a, a notebook on this. And I come home one day, and there's a new microwave in my kitchen. Where did this come from? I went to Walmart and bought it. Did you consult the folder? 
No. Why'd you buy it? It matched our appliances. <laughs> no, like, you know, I've got like a folder that we're compiling here. So this information search, this evaluation of alternatives. Once you evaluate the alternatives, you know what you want for breakfast, granola bar, it's quick, it's easy, it's fast. You, you get it, and then you uh, have this post-purchase evaluation as well. So when you buy something particularly other than the granola bar, you probably know what the granola bar tastes like, you're pretty familiar with it. If you're not that familiar with it, what are you gonna do after you buy it? Well, you might have buyer's remorse. It might not meet all of the things that you wanted it to do, and so the next time you go and you have to purchase something in that category, You'll, you'll do a, a different type of uh, purchase, maybe, and, and start the process all over again. This is called the rational actor model. So what classical economics says is that we have goals. When we talked about ethics in here, we talked about Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant says there are two types of imperatives. We talked about this. There are hypothetical imperatives, and those exist because you want something. Right? So let's think about why you're sitting here at 11 o'clock today and what you purchased in this package of stuff that you're getting here at UCF. Why are you sitting here? What was it that you hypothetically wanted? You wanted a job. And in order to get a good job, you knew that you'd better go to college. Or at least to have a shot at that job. So then what did you do when you decided that you were going to purchase a college education, because this is a purchase decision. What did you all do? You what? Before you did anything else, you put down a lot of money, you just, you just ran to the first college. Researched research colleges, right? How is it that you ended up here at the Harvard of the Hills? Huh? You just purchased it based on cheap. And location? Cheap and location? Okay, there are lots of there are lots of colleges in the Oklahoma City metro area that you could have gone to, right? Well, there's OU. It's not much more expensive than you is it? Yeah. It's still a state school. A lot more expensive. Okay. So you, you look for the low cost alternative. You what? Okay, so you did external search by talking to your friends. And they said what? And so ultimately you decided to do what? How did you purchase? Well, you filled out an application for admission, and you came here, right? And then you decided what? What else is involved in this purchase decision making process? What? Before you get to classes, what are you going to have to think about? Major, right? You're going to have to think about when you, when you come in, they're going to want you to declare a major. How many of you declared a major right off? Okay, how many of you declared something like general studies because you didn't know? One person, only one person? Uh, usually there's more than that that'll say, I started out as a general studies major and then I realized, what am I gonna do with that degree? Can I get a job? And so you reevaluate in, in this process. And that, when we talk about services, we'll talk about some differences in services between services and product evaluation. So you came to UCO, you purchased this, and then what are you going to do in terms of after this purchase decision? Well, you're going to evaluate the decision, right, based on what happens after college in terms of your ability to what? Get a job that you want. So uh, that, that'll play into it. If you don't get the job that you want, you may do what? You're going to buy another college degree? You may. You may do what? You may go 
get a master's degree and decide that that's what you need in order to make yourself more marketable. People are adding degrees as a way to differentiate themselves from their competition in the workforce, aren't they? I think the master's degree has now become what a bachelor's degree was 20 years ago in many respects, in many fields. If you want to advance, you're going to have to have maybe the master's degree. So this is all very rational. You had a goal, you wanted to get a better job, so you went about searching out colleges, finding out the one that you wanted to go to based on a number of factors that were important to you. It sounds like a lot of you, those factors were price. But if you wanted to get a degree in, oh, I don't know, say engineering, could you have come to UCF? <laughs> no. Who has the engineering degrees? OU. OU and OSU. If you wanted to get a degree in, uh, I don't know, uh, physical therapy, could you come to UCF? Yes. I don't think we have physical therapy program. Uh, that's true. They have changed it. It used to be that physical therapy was just a uh, undergraduate degree. Now it's a, it's a, they've got a doctorate in physical therapy. So that's true. But Langston has a physical therapy program. OU Health Sciences has a physical therapy program. If you want to go to pharmacy, things like that, you're probably going to have to go other places besides UCO. So those kinds of factors enter into your decision. Now, in contrast to rational active theory, the antithesis is maybe what we can call irrational active theory. So Now when we talk about rational action theory, and this is one of the questions that I will ask you on your critical thinking challenge. First of all, the first question will be, is it possible to pursue an irrational goal in a rational manner? So that's the first question for the critical thinking challenge. We'll talk about this. Is it possible to pursue an irrational goal in a rational manner? Or are you merely stuck with irrational actor theory? Now, what irrational actor theory, as an antithesis might say, if we label it as such, there are other, there are other things that people call it, um, is that people don't really behave rationally. They simply respond to stimuli. When we talked about ethics, we talked about something called psychological egoism or psychological determinism that says that no matter what you do as a result of either nurture or nature, you are genetically programmed, biologically or sociologically programmed to respond to stimuli in a certain way. And you're just going to react to those stimuli. This may be the irrational model. You simply react. Why is it that you go buy food at the food court? You're walking by, are you really all that hungry? Well, you smell it, and all of a sudden you may become a little bit hungry, and you decide to waltz in and buy a cheeseburger from Fat Tire. Good decision? Of course. Is it really? I think it's a poor decision. I'm not sure that any of the food over there is anything other than laden with saturated fat, way too much sodium, lots of carbs and cholesterol. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's not. So I think we think we know what we're doing a lot of times, but maybe we don't. Let's consider this. This is a video by a brand scholar named Brian Wansing. He's at Cornell University. And he actually is one of the few marketers that you'll find that has a lab and does actual experiments. So when we talked about marketing and research, we talked about a lot of the scientific research and marketing is not really done in a lab setting. It's done with survey research, people's opinions. But Dr. Wansink actually has a lab. And one of my major professors in the doctoral program was a fellow under Dr. Wansink at Cornell and did a postdoctoral uh, fellowship with him because he has a PhD in psychology, not marketing. And so he did this kind of food study. So what Dr. Wansink looks at 
is what people think of in terms of foods and branding and things like that. And he's written a book called Mindless Eating. So I want you to consider this as an irrational actor model for consumer behavior. Book Mindless Eating. He's director of the Food and Brand Lab at Cornell University, and he's here with me, and we are going to experience mindless eating. What exactly? Hi. What exactly is mindless eating? Well, mindless eating is eating more than we think we're eating and enjoying a lot less than we, than we otherwise would. You mean we can't keep track of how much we're eating? Well, the typical person makes 200 decisions about food a day. If you were to ask them, they'd believe they made about 15. But in reality, just for breakfast, <laughs> well, just for breakfast, they decide what cereal to have, whether to pour one bowl or two bowls, skim milk, whole milk, to have a refill. There's 12 decisions that are made before you even take a bite. Wow, okay, well, we've got some food here. Uh, what might be influencing me or you to eat more than we think we should? Well, let's look at how much we're going to like it. I can guarantee you're going to like this a lot more than you like this because this is poached eggs on English muffins. This, on the other hand, is eggs for It's described uh, that it has Norwegian salmon. So <laughs> like just, reading, just reading that description off the menu is going to make your expectation that you're going to like the food higher. Having those expectations higher is going to make your taste buds obediently follow. So, so even if it doesn't taste good, if I'm impressed by the description, I'll eat more of it? You may not eat more, but you're going to like it a whole lot more. I mean, one thing we found, even with wine, if we give people wine that says it's from California, yeah. they enjoy the food a lot more than they're eating with it. Or if we tell it's from North Dakota, that even if it's the same wine, you know, they don't like the food as much, they end up finishing earlier, and they end up not making reservations very soon. <laughs> now, one obvious thing here is that, that we have a pro we have really approximately the same meals. Yeah. I've got a few onions you don't have. But your plate is about twice as big as mine. What does that do? Well, what happens is that we find that when people serve themselves onto a, onto a bigger plate, they end up putting a lot more food on it, typically about 30% more, because look, I mean, that looks like a really nice big meal. This, yeah. geez, this looks like barely an appetizer. In fact, to make these plates look similarly full, I mean, I'm going to have to add a few more potatoes. Now, I think it's looking a little bit better now. But so, this, yeah, so we make judgments based on whether there's empty spaces there. Yeah, it's a very subtle bias, but what it does, it suggests to us what the appropriate amount is to eat. And regardless of how tuned in we think we are to our eating decisions, we will serve 25 to 35 percent more under a larger plate than we will a smaller That's plate. a huge amount, though, 25 to 35 percent. It's unbelievable. In some cases, with some foods, it can be up to about 150 calories more per serving, which over the course of a year, 150 calories more each day is 15 pounds heavier at the end of the year. Boy, that's uh, supersizing taken to, uh, <laughs> taken to a different dimension. Okay, so what else? I mean, what, what, it, this looks very straightforward to me. Food on a plate, sure the sizes are different. But what else might be operating here? Well, something else that's operating is anytime we think something... Don't mind if I start eating. Oh, yeah. Mindlessly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. One other thing that's happened is anytime we see something that we believe is healthy, there's a health halo that follows that entire food, it typically makes us believe it has fewer calories and it typically makes us overeat. Like, I want some tomatoes. Look at this. So I get some uh, sauteed tomatoes. Yeah. Now, I'm going to believe this is an incredibly healthy thing for me to eat. And I guess relative to the french fries, it is healthy. But this is going to have a whole lot more calories than you think, because what's going on is uh, there's a, a basic sort of halo that surrounds anything that we believe is good for Like us. a tomato. How could a tomato be unhealthy? Oh, well, I guess if it's cooked in uh, its own weight of olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you do, uh, you don't just sort of look at people uh, operating restaurants, but you, you do experiments in your lab. Can oh, you give me yeah, a sense sure. of the kinds of things that you do? Don't you bacon? Well, of course. Uh, now, well, one of the things we do, should we, I only have like one strip of <laughs> So that I can have the rest. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> one of the things we do, one of the things we do in our lab, our lab is set up with one-way mirrors, it's set up with hidden cameras, it's got scales on the table. What we can do is we can do experiments to see how the lighting affects how much somebody eats, how the number of people are eating with influences how much they eat, how candlelight makes them eat more, and things like this. And what it enables us to do is to tell people what cues they can change in their own house so they can eat less and enjoy food more. 
Now, but it's my, my, the title of your book is Mindless Eating. Is it really possible for people to sort of step back from that and say, I'm being influenced by all these things that you mentioned in the book, I can correct that? Or, or, do, is it, or is it just too easy to fall into the same old habits? It's really easy to fall into the same habits. So that's what the key thing to do is just to reorganize what we call re-engineer your house so that you don't have to make these decisions all the time. So that you're eating off the smaller plates, you're pouring in tall skinny glasses and short white glasses, you're moving the candy bowl six feet away from you rather than leaving it on your desk. That's the sort of thing that, of course, is very easy to do. It's a mindless solution to this. So, Brian, but what if I'm not in that controlled environment at home? I'm out at a restaurant. What should I do? Well, in addition to your entree, you can eat one other item. You can have an appetizer, you can have a side dish, you can have a dessert. You can't have all three. Okay, I'll take it seriously. Thanks, Brian. Dr. Brian Wensick is director of the Food and Brand Lab at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He's also author of Mindless Eating, Why We Eat More Than We Think. Today's TEDx theme is about failure and about solutions. Now we'll talk about a huge failure, and that's the collective American... So in retail, and we'll talk about retailing in here, what do they do to get you to buy more than you should? And what can you do to overcome these impulses? For example, when you go to the grocery store, what's one of the things that you all probably know, and you've heard probably on NPR, the radio, or lots of talk, uh, talk television uh, shows like The View or things like that about what you can do in terms of losing weight. We are obsessed in this country with weight loss, aren't we? We're obsessed with being thin. So what are some of the things, what's the number one recommendation that they can tell you to do uh, in terms of weight loss and purchasing? Only walk around the edges of the store. Only walk around the edges of the store, okay. Well, because the edges of the store usually have like the vegetables and the meat in the middle of the store. The non-processed stuff. Yeah, has all of the like candy and processed flour and all like the stuff they put in the little aisles. What about before you ever get to the store? Yeah. Don't go to the store when you are hungry. How many of you have done this? Gone to the grocery store when you're hungry and what ends up happening to your purchasing ability? You are in a weakened state and you buy a lot more. This is the irrational actor, right? You go in, you're hungry, and all of a sudden, everything looks good to you, doesn't it? And so you start piling this stuff into your cart. So don't go into the store hungry. What else have we done in terms of organization of the store to get you to buy more? Well, in order to get to the stuff along the edges of the side, what do most people do when they go into the store? They go straight through the middle, right? And they're, they're passing all of the stuff to get the, to those staple things that you need which are at the back of the store. And then before you get out of the store, we get you again with what? The candy on the end caps of the, you know, so you're hungry, you're standing there in line, you've got your child with you, they're crying, they're screaming, they want, they're hungry, they want food, and what do you end up buying? That Snickers that's sitting right there, that Butterfinger, those peanut M&Ms or whatever it is, right there on the end cap, right? One of the stores in Oklahoma City that I've noticed has done an even better job of trying to hurt you through and get you to buy more stuff. The Die for Less. How many of you have been, have been to it on 23rd Street in Pennsylvania? 
It's five plus, I call it five plus. <laughs> they, they, they have the, you look, you've got to be very careful about looking at the, the uh, expiration date on stuff in there because they, they get it right, right to the end. They actually start routing you through the store differently in the very beginning. They purge you instantly to the right and past all of the vegetables and stuff like that. Why do they actually want you to do that? Well, because that's the stuff that perishes the most quickly that they want you to buy, that they want to get you to do. And so one of the things that Dr. Wansink does is look at things that we can do that provide information shortcuts to get people to maybe eat uh, healthier. And, and that has got uh, ethical implications in and of itself as well. So a lot of people argue that this is just really a reaction to the stimuli that you are exposed to and that we don't have a lot of control. We think we do, but we just sort of react. We don't really think about these decisions very, very well. And so there's a whole stream of literature that focuses on that. So the second question, and then I will end and give you time to think about this and come up with really brilliant answers so that you can uh, get bonus points. There are opportunities for more than one group to win the critical thinking challenge every day. So if we have a thesis rational actor theory and the antithesis is irrational actor, is there, the second question, is there a synthesis? So the first question, is it possible to pursue an irrational goal in a perfectly rational manner? And what implications does that have for marketing? If we can pursue irrational goals in a rational manner, and two, is there a synthesis between rational actor and irrational actor? If so, what is it? And give examples. If you don't think there's a synthesis, justify your answer. All right? So that's your critical thinking challenge for today. I'm going to give you the rest of class to work on that. You all should have plenty of time between now and Tuesday to come up with a really good answer so that maybe more than one group can win the critical thinking challenge and get those bonus points. The way the bonus points will work, every time there's a critical thinking challenge, if you participate, you get the minimum points, right? If you are not here, you can't get those points. So if you win bonuses, those bonus points will make up for those times that you didn't come. If you come every single time and you have more bonus points than you need for that category, the critical thinking category, those bonus points will flow over to exam scores. So everything that is over and above the points that end up being the total points for critical thinking challenge that are in excess will go over to the exam scores and impact those. So you want to do well on these. Do you all have any questions? If you show up every single time, you get all of the critical thinking, Everything that you get, if you get bonus points, will go over to the exam scores. All right? Anything in excess? Any other questions? Oh, yes. Um, I'll pick them up on Tuesday. How's that? I'll let you have those until your exam scores, until, or your exams uh, from the first uh, Scantron uh, until Tuesday. Do you, do you think Scantron's back? I just think the Scantron's back on Tuesday. 